we just want to exalt you and <clears throat> praise you, Lord, tonight. We thank you, Lord, that we can come tonight and we can just enjoy your presence tonight. But, Father, we just pray that you would, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would just speak to us, you would challenge us, you would encourage us, Lord, you would enlighten us. And, Father, that we would be stirred tonight, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, that, Lord, we would leave this room, Lord, in, a, in about an hour, Lord, different than when we came because, Lord, we've been stirred up by the power of your Holy Spirit. So, Lord, we invite you to come and speak to us. Lord, you know the heart of every person here tonight. And, uh, Father, we just uh, pray that you would just, you would just speak to each one of us, we pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated tonight. Listen, thanks for coming. I um, didn't know what to expect, and uh, so I uh, appreciate um, that, that you came tonight. And uh, the whole uh, goal here this evening is to begin a four-part a four series on the Holy Spirit and uh, helping you hopefully connect even more strongly with the Holy Spirit. And my goal tonight, this is our, my, my introductory session of the four. Uh, today, tonight, we're, it'll be, uh, my goal tonight is to, to provoke you, to stir you, to create hunger in you uh, for the Holy Spirit in your own life. That's my goal. And that you'll leave just saying, Lord, I just need more of you, and I need more of you in my life every day. Uh, next week, I want to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the third week, we want to talk about the importance of hearing from the Holy Spirit, hearing the voice of God as it relates to, to, to ministry, as it relates to praying for people, as it relates to hearing God in your, moving in the gifts of the Spirit. And the very last session is on the gifts of the Spirit, and I won't be doing that session. Actually, Mark Hughes will be doing that last session. He, he won't be here in person, but he'll be here on video, and this is a session that he actually taught at our Lifelinks conference in October, and it was such an amazing uh, presentation that it's just you would you would be blessed to to just hear it and watch it, and I believe, and then we can we can go from there afterwards. So that's the way it'll it'll be for the next four Sunday nights. And so tonight we want to start with connecting with the Holy Spirit. And uh, I don't know about you, but I when I look around at my at believers, I look at even in my own life, and I look at churches today, I'm not satisfied. Are you satisfied? How many think there's more? How many think we could be experiencing more of the Holy Spirit moving in our own personal life, in our churches? And so I've been, as I've been, was preparing this session for tonight, I want to tell you that I was provoked, uh, even in, in my own personal life. And I think what's happened is, and unfortunately, we have marginalized uh, the ministry uh, and the presence of the Holy Spirit in much of, uh, much of what we do in terms of of being believers. And uh, it's interesting how ignorant people are of the Holy Spirit. Now, I know you folks are different. I know that you're fairly knowledgeable. And so a lot of what I'm going to have to say seriously won't be new to you. Uh, but again, my goal is to remind us of some things if, it's, if it isn't new to you. And for some of you, it might be new. But I, uh, I remember when I first became a Christian, I, you, most of you know my story, uh, how I came out of a non-Christian background and then... And had an incredible encounter with the Holy Spirit, and, uh, which led to me becoming a believer. And uh, the very first church that Linda and I attended, I was, I was still in university, but it was a Presbyterian church. And it was a very mainline church, and I would say that the majority of the people in that congregation uh, were not born again. And uh, so it was, it was the issue, of just, there was only, I think, about eight of us in the whole church that were probably born again, and we met at the at the pastor's house, and of course, uh, you know, I was told that as a Christian that the Holy Spirit w was within me, and, uh, and that's true, and I believed that and accepted that, and I was grateful just to be going to heaven. I was grateful just to have eternal life, but then we moved. Uh, I graduated from university, and we moved to Manitoba, and I started teaching school there, and uh, Linda and I, because there was no Presbyterian church in that community, uh, which freaked us out a little bit. Uh, we, uh, with much fear and trepidation, went to an evangelical church in the community just on the street from us where we lived, and, and it was a, a cessationist church. In other words, they didn't believe uh, that in the gifts of the Spirit, they didn't believe that the Holy Spirit healed the sick, 
They didn't believe that the Holy Spirit did anything other than cause us to be born again. And then we got saved and you held on until you went to be with the Lord or the Lord came for you, one or the other. And that was the, and, and the teaching was that when you re became born again as a Christian, the Holy Spirit was within you. And that was as much of the Holy Spirit that you were ever going to experience. And that was it. And so as a brand new Christian who hadn't even read his Bible through one time, I, I just accepted that. Until uh, one night, uh, Linda and I had been leading some people to the Lord, and a gathering, a, people, a bunch of people gathered in our home one night, and we got on a, in a Bible study on the Holy Spirit. And uh, during this Bible study, uh, this woman that was there uh, challenged me on my understanding of the Holy Spirit and said that there was actually a second experience in the Holy Spirit called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit actually comes upon you uh, for power, for to move in the gifts of the Spirit. And so that was totally different than anything I had been taught up to that time. And so we kind of got in a little bit of a, an argument about that. And, uh, but she didn't back down. And so the Bible study ended, and uh, I couldn't get her words out of my mind. I kept thinking, what if she's right? What if there is more to the Holy Spirit than what I have presently understood? And so then I became very hungry about that, and so I wanted to, I wanted to know whether that was true. And so it, it set me off into a study um, of the Word of God for a, basically a year, where I studied the Scriptures and I dug into the Word of God because I needed to know one way or the other what the truth was. And I found out that she was right that there is another experience in the Holy Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit actually wants to be very present in our lives. And I realized that I, my understanding was lacking. Now, <clears throat> one of the interesting things, if you just studied the Old Testament and the New Testament, never read any books, never talked to anybody, um, you would come away with an incredible expectation of the Holy Spirit moving in your life. When you study this word, that's what you get. The Holy Spirit wants to move dramatically in each of our lives and in our churches. And we know that when Jesus knew that his death was near, that he told them that there was another, he was going to send another counselor to them. It says in John chapter 14, verse 16, hopefully it's on, this, it's on the screen. But in John 14, verse 16, uh, Jesus said to his disciples, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Then he actually told them that it would be to their advantage that he was going away. In John 16, verse 7, he said, But I tell you the truth, it is your, to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So what Jesus was saying, you know, it's great that you guys have me, but there's something better than that. I'm going to go away, and I'm going to send you the Helper, and it's to your advantage that the Holy Spirit comes. I think it's hard for us to believe that, and I think it was hard for the disciples to say, how could that be true? How could that be an advantage? But the truth of the matter is, it is an advantage, if we take advantage of it. And of course, we know in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, Jesus said, gathering together, and this is after his death and resurrection, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard it from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So he said, don't go anywhere. Stay in Jerusalem. I don't think they had any idea what to expect. They said, he's coming. What's that going to look like? They had no clue, no idea. They, but they were obedient, and we know that about 120 of them hung around Jerusalem, were in prayer and praying and believing God, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit showed up. And when he showed up, it was nothing that they had ever seen before. It was nothing that is described Anywhere in the Bible up to that time. We know the story. How a mighty wind came blowing into the room. And how tongues of fire were upon every head. And they were speaking in other tongues. And were filled 
with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit was upon them, and they spill out into the streets and cause such an uproar that the city at that time was filled with pilgrims from various nations and tongues and tribes of, of the world uh, who were in Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost, and we know that they were shocked because no matter what language they came from or what their native language was, they heard it. They heard these people speaking of the great and wondrous things of God in a language that they could hear and understand. And so we know that from that point on, as you read through the book of Acts, we find that the, that the, that the, the world was turned upside down. That first generation of believers turned the world upside down in one generation. How did they do that? They did it through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, do we need that same power? We do. What does the city of Regina need more than anything else? It needs believers empowered by the Holy Spirit, full of the Holy Spirit, and this city could be turned upside down. This province could be turned, up, turned upside down. This nation could be turned upside down. There's enough power to do it. Do you, do you believe that? And it's really the difference between whether we are moving in the Holy Spirit or whether we're not moving in the Holy Spirit. And I believe that there's, if we, re, if we read the scriptures, we, we have to agree, we have to come to the conclusion that a Christian filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, is a lot different than a Christian who is not living in the power of the Holy Spirit. There's a difference. And unfortunately, even though this power is available to every Christian, many Christians do not live like that. Many Christians don't even think they really actually need the Holy Spirit. Many Christians are satisfied, hey, you know what, I'm born again, I'm going to heaven, I'm living a pretty good life, I'm pretty comfortable, I'm just going to go through my life, and then I'm going to go to heaven. A lot of believers and a lot of churches, if we're really gut level honest with one another, we settle for that. And we're okay with not making that big of an impact. <clears throat> and there's many Christians that they don't know what to do with the Holy Spirit. A.W. Tozer, a famous leader in the early part of the 20th century, uh, wrote a lot of books. He put it this way. He said, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on. And no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop, and everybody would know the difference. I think, he's, I think he's on to something there. I think that it's true that many Christians don't really expect the Holy Spirit to act. They don't expect it. Do you expect it? Do I expect it? When you come here on a Sunday morning, what do you expect? We could come and say, well, you know, the worship team is going to lead us through a list of songs that they prepared beforehand, and then maybe somebody might pray, and the pastor will stand up and preach, and then we'll pray, and we'll go home, and we'll have, we'll have coffee, and we'll have cookies. And not that there's anything wrong with any of that, but if that's all we expect, I think we're missing something. I think we should be coming here on a Sunday morning and saying, Wow, the body is gathering together. The saints are coming together as one body, as a temple of the Holy Spirit. And you know what? I have an anticipation in my heart that God's going to do something here today. That God's going to do something in my life. Not just, I mean, it's great if he does it in somebody else's life, of course. But God's going to do something for me. God's going to speak to me. God's going to stir me. God's going to minister to me in some way by the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, we come with an expectation. One of the interesting things is that we can do a lot of things through our natural abilities and our natural talents. We can even grow churches without the Holy Spirit. With slick advertising and the right kind of marketing, we can increase the size of the crowd that would gather here on a Sunday, on a Sunday morning. Is that the goal? I don't think that's the goal. What's really interesting is people are afraid of the Holy Spirit. People are afraid in one of two ways. One, of this, one is that they're afraid if they, 
ask the Holy Spirit to show up, he won't show up. And then God would fail. That's one of the fears that people have. And then the other fear they have is they would ask the Holy Spirit to show up, and he would show up. And that would scare them as well. Because we wouldn't know what he was going to do. And what would he do with you? And so we're afraid on both sides. That he, we could ask him to come and he won't come, or we could ask him to come and he does come. And then what? But you know, Luke eleven thirteen 13 says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You know, sometimes people say, well, you know, the Holy Spirit's a real gentleman, and he would never ask you to do anything you don't want to do or go anywhere where you don't want to go. Can I tell you something? You show me that in the Bible. That's not my experience in the Holy Spirit, and that's not the experiences of the early church. When I read the New Testament, I don't get that impression. The truth of the matter is, if the Holy Spirit comes into your life, and if you surrender your life to the Holy Spirit, and if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, he is guaranteed to ask you to go somewhere that you don't want to go and to do something you wouldn't normally do. He's guaranteed to ask, you, ask that of you. Because the Holy Spirit is not into you just living a nice, quiet life. The Holy Spirit is interested in you growing to be more like Him. And He will lead you to the cross, which is not exactly a place that we're happy to go to. He will lead you to the cross. He may lead you to a place geographically you do not want to go. He may lead you and scare the daylights out of you, asking you to do something that is beyond your comfort zone. True? If that wasn't the case, I would never have come to Regina. I wouldn't be here. If the Holy Spirit didn't lead you to a place where you didn't necessarily want to go, or lead you to do something that you didn't necessarily want to do. I wouldn't be here. In fact, I wouldn't be in the ministry at all if that was the case. The scary thing is, Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica and said this, do not quench the Spirit, which means it's possible for me to live in such a way or to have a certain kind of attitude or unbelief in, in such a way that actually the Holy Spirit withdraws from me, that actually quench the life and the power of the Spirit for my own life. I don't know about you, but that, I find that verse a little unnerving. Well, let's talk a little bit about some theology of the Holy Spirit. And I'm just going to touch it because there are bo whole books have been written on it, and I don't intend to do that. That's not my purpose here. But I think it's important that we have a correct understanding of who the Holy Spirit is and what he does. And to say that I would, in this particular series, explain everything to you about the Holy Spirit would be impossible. And it would be impossible if I spent the next five years trying to explain to you the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is God and God is incomprehensible. And we cannot fully understand him or comprehend what he does or what he doesn't do or who he is. We are limited in our understanding. We can understand some things, but we do not and we will not totally understand the Holy Spirit or how he operates, or what he does. Now we have, when people try to ex explain God, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, they've used different illustrations to try and explain. You've heard the, the egg uh, explanation where you have the shell, and then you have the white stuff, whatever it's called, then you have the yolk, and they liken that to, so we have three different distinct parts in an egg, but we have one egg, and so that's, why, that's the way the Godhead is. We have the Father, we have the Son, we have the Holy Spirit. Or I've heard it described like this, that it's kind of like three uh, leaves on a, on a clover where they all join to one stalk and it's all one, one clover plant, but there's three different uh, branches to it. And or he's like, God is like water, and you have uh, water, ice, liquid, ice, steam. Uh, those are okay, but they fall short. Isaiah said this, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. In that one verse of scripture, you have the three persons of the Godhead in one, described to you as one God. 
We know that the son, uh, he talks about the son will be, government will be given to the son. He's referred to as the counselor, which is the name for the Holy Spirit. And he's also referred to as father, uh, which of course is the name of the father of the Godhead. And so the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit are one. And then you have a diagram I want to show you uh, right there. And um, it's a diagram of the Trinity. And we see that the Father is co-equal. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit on a horizontal plane are co-equal, co-essential. Co-essential means they have the same nature. They're equal. And then, of course, you, we see the, 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 uh, the vertical relationship where the Father sends the Son, the Son sends the Holy Spirit. And that's the functional operation of how God moves in our lives. That the Father has sent the Son, the Son has sent the Holy Spirit, and the Son has sent us the Holy Spirit to be with us, to work with us, to be active in our lives. And actually, the Holy Spirit is the doer of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is the, is the person of the Godhead who carries everything out. You see him in creation, uh, right in, in Genesis chapter 1, where the Spirit hovered over the waters. And so the Holy Spirit is the doer in what God, God does in the earth, what he does in your life, what he continues to do in your life. That's the, the function of the Holy Spirit. The Father thinks it, the Son articulates it, and the Spirit does it. And so those are some basic truths. When you go back to, when you go to Acts 2, and it says, when the day of Pentecost had come, and they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves. They rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Those are the same disciples that ran away in fear when Jesus was led away to be crucified. Other than John, they were all, none of them were present. And yet, after the day of Pentecost, a radical change has taken place in the lives of these people. They are never the same again. Peter was never the same again. John was never the same again. Paul, when he met Jesus on the Damascus road, when he was filled with the Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands of Ananias in Damascus, he was never the same again. Stephen, Philip, we can go on and on and we look at the various people in the, new, in the book of Acts who were absolutely transformed. They were, they were fearless. It didn't matter what you did to them. They were bold. They were fearless. They moved in the gifts of the Spirit. They moved in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit does for us. And Peter didn't, they did, the Bible doesn't say, well, it was just for those guys. It was just for those first century Christians. And we have the Bible now, so no, we don't need that anymore. That was the teaching of the church that Linda and I were part of, that cessationist church, until I started reading my Bible and realizing, where does it exactly say that? That because we, we have the Bible, we don't need the Holy Spirit anymore. And I couldn't find that verse. And I began to realize, we need the Holy Spirit as badly today as they needed him in the first century. Nothing has changed. And Peter said, when, he, when Peter preached his first message, and these people were responding, he said, what should we do? And Peter said, these words, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off. As many as the Lord our God will call to himself. The promise is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the promise. And that promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. As many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. I think that includes us. The promise is for us. That we are to experience the same transformation in our, in our lives that those first century believers experienced and is described for us in the book of Acts. Well, here's some practical truths about the Holy Spirit. First of all, the Holy Spirit is a person. You know, people said, well, I can understand the Father and I can understand the Son, but the Holy Spirit seems like a blur to me. People try to imagine, what's the Holy Spirit like? Is he like a wisp of smoke, or is he just a, some gray, oblong blur? Is he, what, what, what is he? People refer to him as an it. And of course, we have described him with terms like wind and fire and oil. 
And so when we use those kinds of terminologies, and those are symbols of the Holy Spirit, but when we use those symbols, we can tend to dehumanize or de sorry, depersonalize the Holy Spirit. And he becomes an it rather than a person. He's a person. He's not a thing. He's not a force. He's a person. <clears throat> and so what we're dealing with is the the personal presence of God himself. How many of you experienced God's presence in your life? Where you felt, I sense God's presence. That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, when you sense, when you and I sense the presence of God, we're experiencing the Holy Spirit. He is the presence of God that's with us. He is the helper. He's the comforter. He's the counselor that Jesus has sent to us. We are personally, you individually as a Christian are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He lives in you. And then we corporately, as a body of believers, when the body comes together, we corporately are a temple of the Holy Spirit. He dwells within us. Is the Holy Spirit here right now? You believe that? I believe that. He's here right now. The person of the Holy Spirit. He's not just a wisp of smoke floating up here near the ceiling. No, he's, he's in us. And he's a person. He inhabits us. And it's important that we have that presence personally and corporately. In fact, when Moses was leading the children of Israel uh, from Egypt to the promised land, uh, they offended God at one point. And God said, I know what, I'm not going to go with you. I'm going to send an angel instead. And Moses pled with God. And he said these words. He said, if your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us, so that we, I and your people, may be distinguished from all the other people who are upon the face of the earth? Church, the, what distinguishes us from anybody else is the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That is the distinguishing mark between you and any other religious person that's out there. It's that we have the Holy Spirit. What should distinguish us as a church in comparison to any other organization like the Elks Club or some other club? What distinguishes us? The presence of God. The presence of the Holy Spirit is to be our distinguishing characteristic. The Holy Spirit is God's empowering presence. Paul understood that. When you read... When you read the book of Acts, when you read the epistles of, of the Apostle Paul, Paul understood the Spirit's power in the broadest possible sense. He spoke about the power of God to do miracles, signs and wonders, but the power of the Holy Spirit was also there to strengthen us, all, caused us to be able to endure, caused us to be able to endure hardship, caused us to be able to stand strong in the face of adversity. And so we see His power being manifested in all kinds of ways. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we think, well, you know, I've really prevailed through that trial. And boy, it's by my strength and by my, my strength that I actually got through that. Oh, yeah? I think the Holy Spirit probably strengthened you more than you realize. He's in you to give you that strength and that power. And so per person, presence, power, those are all realities in the life and the experience of the Christian in the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, the Holy Spirit is God. And we, we see that when, when Peter confronted Ananias in Acts chapter 5, he said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land while it remained unsold? Did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. So the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is eternal. The Holy Spirit is holy. Jesus said, I will ask the Father, he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. And in Hebrews 9, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And of course, the spirit is called the Holy Spirit. And Paul wrote, wrote to the, at the church at Rome in chapter 1 and chapter, in verse 5, and chapter 5, sorry, and talking about the Holy Spirit. Fourthly, the Holy Spirit has his own mind, and he prays for us. Romans 8, 26, in the same way, the Spirit 
also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The Holy Spirit is praying for us. That comforts me to know that. He also, also helps us pray for others. Fifthly, the Holy Spirit has emotions. Uh, in Galatians, we find that the Holy Spirit has, has emotions of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. He, he's a person. And again, Ephesians 4, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We can offend the Holy Spirit. We can grieve him. The Holy Spirit has his own desires and wills. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. You know what? It's the Holy Spirit who decides what gifts he's going to give to you. It's the Holy Spirit that decides what gifts he's going to give to me. Whatever gifts you have, it's the Holy Spirit that made the decision to give you those gifts. And he knows what's best. The Holy Spirit is omni, omni, omnipotent, omnipresent. He's omniscient. Here's some of the works of the Holy Spirit. He guides us into all truth. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. The Holy Spirit directs us in the selection of Christian leaders. In Acts 13, verse 2, when the church at Antioch wanted to begin to expand the gospel to other countries and other nations and other people groups. It says, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. It wasn't Barnabas and Saul volunteering. It wasn't the elders on their own at Antioch saying, you know what, we should send out Paul and Barnabas. They were not the ones that chose Paul and Barnabas to go on the first missionary journey. It was the Holy Spirit who said, I selected these two, send them out. It's the Holy Spirit that controls the movements of believers. In Acts chapter 10, verse 19, he says, While Peter was reflecting on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you, but get up, go downstairs and accompany them without misgivings, for I have sent them myself. So it was the Holy Spirit that said to Peter, you go to the house of Cornelius and you share the gospel with them. It wasn't Peter's bright idea. It wasn't anybody else's idea. So will the Holy Spirit direct you and me to certain geographical places? Will he do that? Yes, he will. He will. And it's the Holy Spirit that chooses the fields of operations where we should minister. In Acts 16, verse 6, talking about Paul and Barnabas on their on their missionary journey, he says, they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. God is the one who directs our steps. If we are listening to the Holy Spirit, we should be ministering in the countries and the nations to whom God is sending us. And I told you, I really hope the Holy Spirit is sending you and Joel to Pakistan. <laughs> Because if he isn't, you're in trouble. <laughs> Can I have some water, please, Anatoly? Um, so he is the one. Can you imagine uh, Paul and Barnabas? They're trying to go to Bithynia. Nope, not here. Try to go into Asia. Nope, not here. Not here. Not here. <laughs> right? He just kept saying no, 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 no. And finally, they had a vision of somebody from Macedonia saying, come on over here. It's the Holy Spirit who gives life. It says, <clears throat> it's the Spirit that gives life. The letter kills, the Spirit gives life. The life that's in you, the life that's in me, is by the Holy Spirit. If there's life in us as a body of believers, it's the life of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts us of sin. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, 
will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me and concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer see me and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. It's the Holy Spirit that brings life and he brings freedom. If Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells in you. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. We want the Holy Spirit. He gives us the assurance that we are his children, for we have not received the spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Have you ever heard that voice saying, you are a child of God? How many have heard that voice? How many have heard that voice? Otherwise, we've got a lot of people here not saved. <laughs> That's the Holy Spirit. Assuring your spirit that you belong to him. That's a supernatural event. And of course he works in our lives to make us like him. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there's no law. Are you increasing in the fruits of the spirit in your life? Am I increasing? Those are questions that you should ask yourself. You should look in the mirror and say, Am I, is my joy increasing? Is my self-control increasing? Is my peace increasing? Am I growing? If you are, that's the evidence of the Holy Spirit working in your life. And I think that's a valid question for you and I to ask ourselves. And then, of course, he fills men with power. In Romans chapter 15, verse 18, Paul says, For I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed in the power of signs and wonders in the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem round about as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. There's power as well. We need that power. I hope that even just looking at this inspires you to say, I want more of the Holy Spirit in my life. That's what it did for me when I was just reading these scriptures. I thought, I want more. I want more of his presence in my life. I want more of his power. I want more of his direction. I want more of his guidance in my life. So how do I do it? How do I experience more of the Holy Spirit? You know, Acts chapter 1-8, when Jesus was talking to the disciples about waiting in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit, he said, but you shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth. Can I tell you something? I'm of the conviction that God's supply to you and me is unlimited. That it's not God just, you know, say, just being stingy about this and say, I'm just going to give you a little bit less than what you need. I don't get that impression. I don't think it's the fact that God's holding on on us. I think many times we turn down the supply. We're the ones that say, no, 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 no. Don't, don't interrupt me. Don't bother me. Don't, don't let, no, God, these are the boundaries of my life. You have to operate in this circle here. We do those things. I believe that God wants to show his presence in your life in a, in a greater way. And I believe God wants to show his power in your life in a greater way. I believe God wants you to hear his voice more often and more clearly than you've ever heard before. I believe God wants to direct your steps in ways that will shock you, surprise you, but you won't be bored. I believe God wants to use you. Paul said this, my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. So what's the, what's the key? What's the key? Well, let me give you a few things. First one is surrender. You want more of the, you want more of the Holy Spirit in your life? You want his presence in a greater way? You want to sense his direction, his leading in your life on a greater level? You can you absolutely can, but it involves surrender. You have to yield. 
That's why in James said this. He gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So I believe that surrender is critical. Are you surrendered to the Holy Spirit? How surrendered are you is the question. Do you want God directing your life or do you want to direct your life? Do you want God, the Holy Spirit, to control your, the direction and what happens to you on a day-by-day -day basis? Or do you want to control? And that's not only true of you personally, it's true of us corporately. The second thing is, put yourself in situations that scare you. Put yourself in situations that scare you. Why has God given us the Holy Spirit? Why, what did, why did Jesus tell the disciples to wait in Jerusalem? For what reason? Why did he say power should come upon you? What was the purpose of God's power coming upon them? Talk to me. What was it? To be a witness. To be witnesses of who he is and of his presence in your life and of his salvation and of the gospel. That's why he gave us the power. God equips us, he equips ordinary men and women like you and me to do extraordinary things. He takes common people and equips them to do the uncommon. When you look through history, when you look in the Bible, and you look through history, it was the ordinary men and women who actually turned the world upside down. Paul didn't do it by himself. Peter didn't do it by himself. It was the rank and file Christians that we don't even know their names. In that first generation, they turned the then known world upside down. How did they do it? They were, for the most part, illiterate, uneducated. And they flipped the world on its ear. Instead of the Roman Empire conquering them, they ended up conquering the Roman Empire through the power of the gospel. How did they do it? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. When I look back at my own life, I realized that the times in which I experienced the Holy Spirit in the strongest possible way were the times when I was living by faith and doing things that were uncomfortable for me. Those are the times when the Holy Spirit showed up the most. Is when I put myself in situations where if he didn't show up, I was in a lot of trouble. Those are the times when God, when I saw most, saw the power of God to the greatest degree. You know, Jesus talked about sending us the comforter. But if I'm comfortable... Why do I need a comforter? He sends us the comforter because if I'm really being led of the Holy Spirit, I will find myself in uncomfortable situations. And I will need some comfort to help me. You know, sometimes we think, well, I'm just not sensing his presence. What's wrong? Can I tell you, just because you don't sense his presence does not mean you don't have his presence. Jesus said, you know, said this, or the Holy Spirit said, I'll be with you always. He's with us in the person of the Holy Spirit. He's with us always. But what's the context in which Jesus said, I'll be with you always? Well, it was in Matthew 28, verse 18, when he said, and Jesus spoke, came up and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. But what did he, what was the command? Go and make disciples of every nation, and I'm with you always. But if I'm not going, what would I expect? And so as I make disciples, as I go out, then I, I, can, I can count on the fact that the Holy Spirit will be with me. Now, I know that freaks us out. Say, well, man, you know, I just don't know what to do, and I don't know how to make disciples, and I don't know how to lead anybody to Jesus. And, and, um, but, but you know what? If the Holy Spirit's empowering you, it doesn't take a lot. The very first person I ever led to Jesus, I didn't know what to do. I'd never led anybody to Christ before. And, uh, and the night before I had read this book, I was actually seeking the Lord for the Holy Spirit, actually. And this book was on the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and in this book, they had a, the first uh, chapter was 
was on, and some of you have heard me share this illustration, but the first chapter was that we te treat the gift of God's son like a 10 cent gift. And what the author was saying was that if somebody gave you 10 cents, how many people would you tell? And of course the answer would be nobody. If somebody gave you a dime, you're not going to be motivated to phone up all your friends and say, hey, I got a dime, give them to me. But if somebody gave you $10,000, just handed you $10,000, the odds are you probably tell a few people. Agree? Well, I came to Harvest City Church and they handed out 10 grand. Uh, let me tell you, this place would be full next week, right? They hand out $10,000 to people in this church. And so what the author was saying is we treat the gift of God's son like a 10 cent gift. We don't tell anybody about him. And I was convicted by that. So the next morning, uh, I, was, I was a school teacher at that time. We were, Linda and I were living in a, in a new house in a new subdivision. And I went out and I was sitting on the back step. And the, next ho the house next door to me was being built. And these two young guys were working on a foundation. And I looked at them and immediately the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Well, Dave, 10 cent gift or $10,000 gift? And I swallowed, gulp, and I thought, all right. So I went in the house, I got a tract called, Are You Going to Heaven? And I stuck it in my shirt pocket, and I went out, and we had a, we had a garden out there, and so I was kind of weeding in the garden, looking at these guys, praying, trying to get enough courage to go and talk to them about Jesus, and I didn't know where to start. I didn't know how to do it. And the whole day went by, and I weeded every weed that was possible in that yard. <laughs> but there was, I, had, I could not go over there. And finally... One of the guys, young guys, jumped on his bike and rode away, and there was only one guy left, and it was about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and, uh, and I was discouraged with myself, and I said this to the Lord, God, I'm just too chicken to go over there and tell him about Jesus, because I don't even know what to do. So then I said, Lord, if you really want me to talk to him, you're going to have to bring him into my yard. And right at that point, Linda threw Tracy out in the backyard, who was just a little toddler, and said, told me to watch her over for a few minutes, she was going to make supper. And uh, he, this young guy, walked into our yard and picked her up and started talking to her. So I had just prayed, God, you want me to talk to him? You're going to have to bring him over here. So he was there. So I went towards this guy, and I whipped out this tract, and I said something about heaven. And he fell on his knees, and tears squirted out, and he, gave, he prayed to receive Jesus right there. And I, I was looking at him, my jaw was hanging open. <laughs> what was that? That was the power... <laughs> Of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And of course, he went home and got his Bible, came back that night, and we did a Bible study with him, and he's still in the Swan River Church to this day. <clears throat> Can I say this to you, that the Holy Spirit will give you the power to live an overcoming, victorious life, but you have to be willing to step out of your comfort zone. Say, well, I want to experience more of God's power. I want to have more of his presence in my life. You can, but you have to be willing to, number one, be surrendered to him, and number two, be willing to step into situations that are uncomfortable for you. Whether that be just talking to somebody about Jesus or praying for them or whatever it might mean. <clears throat> I believe that's how Linda and I ended up in the ministry. Because... A short time after that, I was on my knees one afternoon, and I made a commitment to the Lord to surrender. And I said, God, I will do anything, any place, anywhere, anytime. If you open a door of opportunity, I will walk through that door, whether I feel qualified or not qualified, whether I'm scared stiff or not. If you open the door, I will go through that door. And a few days later, the phone rang, and I was invited to, to start a youth ministry in the high school that I was teaching in, and it scared the daylights out of me. And I was, I was going to say no, but the Holy Spirit reminded me of what I had committed a few days before. And so I realized that the Holy Spirit was taking me up on my challenge that I would do, go anywhere, do anything if the door opened. I wouldn't pry open doors. I wouldn't try to make things happen. But if the door opened, I'm going to do it. If I have the opportunity to talk to somebody about Jesus, I'm going to talk to them about Jesus. And so here I am uh, getting an invitation. And that was the very first major step that Linda and I took in terms of ministry. And we just kept saying yes. And here we are 40 years later here. I remember the very first time I ever prayed for somebody who was sick. I'd never seen anybody pray for the sick before. Um, I was in a church that didn't believe in it. And, uh, we, had one, and, uh, and, this, and we didn't have a pastor in those years. And this church uh, was, had a, did something unheard of. They, they, offered, they invited this Pentecostal spirit-filled guy to be their interim pastor for six months. 
And so Linda and I built a relationship with him, and he began to instruct us. And he, of course, he, he believed in the gifts of the Spirit. And so one night he called me, and he said, Dave, he says, there's a member of our congregation who has serious heart issues, and she's, she's bedridden. She, her heart is so bad, they, she can't even get out of bed. And uh, she, she's probably going to die soon. She's a woman, and about, she's about 50 years of age. And he said, I'm going to go over and pray for her. Would you come with me? And so I thought, hey, this gives me a chance to see him pray for somebody who's sick. And so I said, yeah, I, I'd like to see that. I'd never seen anybody pray for that's sick. So I went with him and went to the house. And, and of course, they, you know, they served us some tea and cookies. And we sat there and had small talk. And then it came time to pray for her. And she was laying on a couch. She was laying in the Chesterfield in the living room. And, uh, and then to my horror, he, this pastor turns to me and said, Dave, um, I want you to pray for her. And I had never even heard anybody pray for the sick. I didn't know what the words were. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what, what you did. And so I was petrified, literally petrified. And so I, I stood up, but I was in shock, actually. And I stood up, and I went across the room. And these were the kinds of thoughts that were going through my head. I am so filled with unbelief right now. Uh, I don't have any expectation this woman's going to be healed. I'm going to end up praying some stupid prayer. And she's going to die, and it's going to be my fault. That's what was in my head. I thought, this is terrible. This is a, why doesn't he do it? He knows how to do it. I don't know how to do it. I've never even seen it done before. So I went over, and I laid hand, put my hand on her, and I prayed some kind of prayer. And she was instantly healed. Um, and she lived to her 90s. She lived in, into her 90s and never died of something else, never died of any, anything to do with her heart. And so that was my first experience in seeing the sick healed. Now, how was my faith level? Not high. But I had enough faith to get up and walk across that room and to pray a faithless prayer. And the Holy Spirit said, good enough. I can work with that. Amen? You see, we, we fall into the trap saying, i got to pray my best prayer, and i got to feel really spiritual, and i got to feel anointed, and i got to have the hair in the back of my neck uh, on end, and uh, i got to really feel the goosebumps, and uh, then I'm really anointed, and we're going to see something happen. That's not been my experience. I've had those kinds of times. Usually they never get healed. <clears throat> because it's not you and me. We don't have the power in ourselves. We, the one who has the power is within us and upon us. It's his power, not my power. My job is to surrender and be obedient to what he wants me to do. And lots of times I've seen God move when I haven't sensed emotionally his presence at all. And I've seen God probably do the most powerful things when I haven't sensed his presence at all. So just say, well, I don't feel very spiritual right now or I don't feel his presence is not a good enough reason to say no. Say yes. In Luke chapter 12, verse 11, it says, When they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, don't worry about how or what you're going to speak in your defense or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Several years ago, I was in Rwanda right after the genocide. And the country was in it was a disaster. The whole infrastructure of the country had collapsed. There was no banks. There was, it was terrible. And there was hardly any food. There was no food in the stores. People were on the edge of starvation. It was gruesome. And so one, one morning, a knock came to my door, and they said, you're going to be speaking to the cabinet ministers of Rwanda, the government of Rwanda, in about an hour. Get, get dressed. That was not planned. I said, what? How? How did this happen? And I didn't even have a pair of pants to wear because I had luggage had not made it to Rwanda, and all I had was a pair of blue jeans, and I, didn't, I had bought an African dress shirt the day before, but I had no, nothing other than blue jeans. And this was a, a suit and tie, tuxedo, dress-up affair at Hotel Rwanda. If you ever saw that movie, Hotel Rwanda, it was in that hotel. And so I am stunned. And I said, so I was able to borrow some pants off another African guy in the, in the city of Kigali. That kind of fit me. And I had this shirt on. I was still way underdressed. I'm in a taxi, and I'm driving to Hotel Rwanda, and I'm thinking, what am I going to say to these guys? I've had no prep, 
no time to even think about it. There's no direction. Did they say you're going to be speaking to them? And so I remember praying and the Lord saying, talk to them about Nehemiah. So I thought, okay. And so when I got in there, the Holy Spirit gave me in that hour what to say. And basically I challenged them that Nehemiah built a wall and rebuilt a city and they had the opportunity to rebuild a country. And I used that as an illustration and God was in it. But can I tell you that the Holy Spirit gives you just something to say in that hour, not three days before. In that hour, he gave me what to say. Was I frightened? Absolutely, I was petrified. But the Holy Spirit was there. One other time I was in Vietnam, in a room, and this is back in the 90s when the church was really persecuted, and I found myself in a room with a bunch of pastors, leaders, some of the top leaders in Vietnam, and I was in this room with them for three days, and they expected me to teach and preach for eight hours a day for three days. No opportunity to prepare at all. All I did was, say, well, God, open my Bible, start preaching. And you know what? It was amazing what God put in my mouth in that period of time. Was, it, was I comfortable? I was very uncomfortable the whole time because I was scared stiff the whole time. But God gave me what to say, and I said it. He didn't give it to me three weeks before in Canada, he gave it to me when I was there on the moment, which is what he said he would do. In that hour, I will tell you what to say. I think prayer, I'm going to close with this. Prayer is the key to moving in the Holy Spirit. We know the story, the lame man at the gate. I'm not going to read the scripture, but you know the story about the lame man at the gate and how Peter and John came by one day in the hour, of, in a time of prayer to pray, and they... We know the story of how they said, we don't have any silver and gold, but we do have something for you today. And they grabbed him by the hand and jerked him to his feet, and he was instantly healed. A man that had been lame for 40 years. Prayer brings power. And finally, the last thing is, God's power flows where there's expectancy. The thing about the lame man at the gate was this. He wasn't necessarily expecting to be healed, but he was expecting something. And his, I want to tell you that expectancy is an important attitude for you and I to have for the Holy Spirit to move in our lives. The problem with us is we come to God not expecting anything at all. We come to church not expecting anything at all. We go to, our, we go to read the Word and we don't necessarily expect to hear anything. Or we go to prayer and we say, am I going to hear anything? Can I tell you, having an expectancy in God is important in terms of the person of the Holy Spirit showing up in your life. Hudson Taylor, I'll close with, close with these two quotes. Hudson Taylor, a famous missionary of China in the 1800s, said this, attempt great things for God, expect great things from God. He also said this, many Christians estimate difficulties in the light of their own resources and thus attempt little and often fail in the little they attempt. All God's giants have been weak men who did great things for God because he reckoned on his power and presence with them. I believe that it's important for you and I to have an expectancy that God's going to move on my life and on your life. And I believe that if we got up every morning and said, Holy Spirit, Come, Holy Spirit, direct my, day, my steps today. Holy Spirit, let me see opportunities today. Holy Spirit, put people in my heart that you want me to pray for. Holy Spirit, let somebody come across my path that I can speak to. Holy Spirit, let me see the opportunities that you have. And if we approach our life that way, you'd be amazed at how many opportunities there actually are. And many times, if we're not expecting, we're not in that kind of a, a mindset, those opportunities pass us by. We don't see them. And, we, and we're, we miss living in the exciting power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine what would happen to us as a church if we all tuned up? What would happen to us as a congregation? What kind of an impact that we could make in this city and beyond? I believe, that, I believe the promise is there. I believe, that, I believe that's the heart and mind of God.
And I believe that would be true for any church, any congregation of people in this city. If they said, hey, we're available, we're hungry, we're hungry for your presence, we're surrendered, God, we just want you in our life. We don't care if we're scared half to death, at least we're alive. Amen? At least we know we're breathing. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for this group of people tonight. I pray, Lord, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you just make us hungry. Lord, if nothing else, if we got nothing else out of tonight, Lord, I pray that you'd make us hungry. That, Lord, we'd say, I'm not satisfied with my own life the way it is. I want more. I want more of your presence. I want more of your power. I want more of your direction. I want you directing my steps in a more deliberate way. Lord, I want to see what you're doing. I want to see the opportunities that would come to me on a day-by-day basis. Lord, I want to hear your voice. I want to I want to pray the prayers that you want me to pray. I want to live the way you want me to live. I want to see an increase, Lord, in the fruits of the Spirit in my own life. I want to see an increase in love, in joy, in peace, in self-control, in patience. I want to see an increase of those attributes in my own life. And God, we want to praise you. We want to thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, uh, you're, you're free to go, but if anybody had any questions, not that I would have the answers necessarily, but if anybody has any questions, uh, we could take a few minutes and, a, and, and try and do that. Um, Roddy has a mic there that if you have a question, you stick your hand up, try, try and address it. Uh, but you're free to go at this point too, so we don't want to keep you any longer than, than what we said. Any questions that anybody would have on anything I've said or shared or maybe even what I didn't share? Thank you. I was going to say either I did such a great job that they're eliminated all questions or you can hardly wait to get out of here. <laughs> so, just, just. Did you ever have the opportunity to speak with that lady again at that prayer meeting who talked about the, the higher level of the Holy Spirit? Are you talking about the one we pray for for healing? Oh, yes. Yes, I did. And, um, you know, I, was, I got filled with the Holy Spirit as a result of that, probably about a year later. But then it was kind of hilarious. Actually, it wasn't hilarious at the time. But her husband became very offended at me. And one night he showed up at my door and was pounding at my door about 11 o'clock at night. And I opened the door and he was yelling and screaming at me because he thought I had been the one that caused his wife to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I was innocent. I did not pray for her with the Holy Spirit. She was way ahead of me. But he accused me of doing that, and so that was, but yeah, I had contact with her <laughs> and with her husband. <laughs> but yeah, I did. You know, we, we ended up, because of that, we ended up, Linda and I ended up with a bit of a revival with a bunch of, with young people, and it caused a real stir, and then when we got filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit, people started coming to our house because they heard that if they came to our house, they could get the Holy Spirit. So people would, would knock on our door and say, we hear we can get the Holy Spirit here. And we invite them in. And we had this little rug that Linda had crocheted in the living room. And we felt if you knelt on that rug and we lay hands on you, you'd get baptized in the Holy Spirit. So, so we, I don't know if we still have that rug. If, we, if so, we should maybe bring it tomorrow, next week, <laughs> get you to kneel on it. But. Actually, it was a hooked rug, not crochet. <laughs> a hooked rug, not crochet. And I was going to university when I started that. And my husband and I were, were going together. And so we were finishing this up, and he decided to put some rows in, just so you know, and the rows were all put in, all backwards on the rug. But, but, that, but that was a holy rug. It was just a little round circle one. <laughs> and when people would come there, it seemed like they would just kneel there because our floor was hard, so we'd tell them to kneel on that little rug, and the Holy Spirit would fall. It was awesome. So we still might have that rug if you're interested. <laughs> Giving the receive the guys will receive the Holy Spirit. They fall down, and uh, do we have to do all that? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you might. Um, you know, fall, it, it, there's lots of examples in Scripture of people falling down in the presence of, of God, and even historically through revivals, that's not uncommon. Where people will lose bodily strength when they encounter the Holy Spirit, and in fact, you can have all kinds of manifestations 
when people encounter the Holy Spirit. And sometimes it looks like, you know, you've heard the terms holy rollers and all those kinds of things. Well, let me tell you, I've seen all of that. And you say, well, is that in the flesh? Well, it can be, but not always. Uh, I believe it's when a, when a human being encounters the person of the Holy Spirit, it's like a warm front meeting a cold front. Something's going to happen. And, uh, and many times people will manifest in some way, physically even, emotionally, because they've encountered the Holy Spirit. I don't get freaked out by that. Um, it's, it, many times God's doing something very powerful in that person's life. So I'm going to let the Holy Spirit do what he's going to do. I mean, just like when I go to other countries or even here, when I've seen people who are demonized, and when we pray for them, when the demon manifests, they can go through all kinds of things. So it's, it's, a, it's a reaction to, you can have a reaction to the Holy Spirit, you can have a reaction to an, an evil spirit too. But you're going to have a reaction. So, But no, I've seen people very quietly baptized in the Holy Spirit and no, no, no emotion. It just depends on the person. Any other questions? Lead us the Holy Spirit. Even things that I haven't talked about tonight. But So I have some confusion then. Um, I was baptized as, as an infant. And then um, after I became a Christian, I was at a gathering from some guy on TV. And he touched my head and I did fall. So, but... It, but I wasn't baptized as an adult in the Holy Spirit. So once you have the whole, once I feel like when I fell that time that I did have the Holy Spirit, is that forever now? Or does it come and go? How does... If you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you have, you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. As an you, infant. You have it. You don't lose it. Okay. Uh, I've had people who said, you know, I, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, I think... 30 years ago, and I spoke in tongues, but I haven't spoken in tongues since, and I don't think I'm still baptized in the Holy Spirit. They are. And, and it's really a matter of them re responding again to the Holy Spirit. And uh, so, yeah. And you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit before you're baptized in water. I mean, Acts chapter 10 is an example of that, where in Cornelius' house, when Peter preached the gospel, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit first, and then they baptized him in water. And you say, well, why did the Holy Spirit do it that way? Because... It was the first time the gospel had been preached to Gentiles. And if Peter would have given his great sermon and given an altar call for them to come forward for salvation, he had, he had some Jews with him. I think he was six Jews with him. They never would have believed that these Gentiles were born again because they didn't believe that a Gentile could be saved. But when they saw the Holy Spirit fall on them and they heard them prophesying and speaking in tongues, they couldn't deny it that these guys were born again. And that's why Peter ordered them to be baptized in water. And then in the Acts chapter 11, the apostles call Peter up on the carpet and say, you went to the house of Gentiles and you ate with them and what were you doing there? And Peter then says, hey guys, I went there because of the vision that God gave me and when I was preaching, the Holy Spirit fell on them exactly like he did us on, in Acts chapter, in, in the upper room and described in Acts chapter 2. So who was I that I could forbid? these guys to be baptized in water. Because if you weren't baptized in water in the days of the early church, they did not consider you to be a part of the body of Christ. That's why Peter ordered them to be baptized in water. And I think, again, that's something that we've gotten away from. We have the idea that water baptism is optional. It's not optional biblically. Uh, it, it, because if you were not baptized in water in the first century church, they would not recognize you as being part of the body of Christ. Because water baptism is an indicator of your surrender, that Jesus is Lord, and you're absolutely surrendered to him, that you're born again, and that you're buried in the waters of baptism, and you've risen to newness of life. And if you didn't go through that, they wouldn't believe you. And so that's why in Acts 10, at the very end, Peter orders them to be baptized in water. He doesn't suggest it to them. He commanded them. And so we've lost sight of that. We've kind of said, well, you know, it doesn't really matter. I think it does matter. So if you're not water baptized tonight, you need to be. Any other questions? That's okay, I, I'm back. <laughs> so I was baptized as an infant. You still need to be baptized in water because it's a believer's baptism. I was baptized as an infant too by non-believing parents. Yes. And, and when I got saved, I realized my baptism was not valid because somebody else can't baptize me 
they can't do it for me. I have to decide that. I have to choose. It's my, it's my faith. It's, my, it's a step of my faith. Nobody can do that for me. So it's a believer's baptism. So if you're baptized as an infant and you've never been baptized as a believer, my, I would say you need to be baptized as a believer. Any other questions that somebody would have to do with the Holy Spirit? Okay, next week we're going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we will pray for people if there's people that need to be prayed for. Uh, in fact, and also on, the, on the, um, the third session on hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, we'll pray for people there as well, again. And, uh, and after Mark's session on the gifts, which is probably the best presentation I've ever heard on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, um, he does an excellent job. Uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. We'll just play that by ear. Uh, there may be some questions after, after his presentation. Um, and then we'll also have a, have a ministry time as well. But tonight was just kind of like an introduction. Hope I didn't bore you to tears. Uh, hopefully you'll come back next week if you, if you can. And uh, so I appreciate so much that you came tonight. Uh, let's just stand. Let's just close in prayer. I'm certainly willing to pray for anybody here tonight. If you feel like, hey, I'd just like to receive prayer. Um, there's some of us here. We would definitely pray for you. Uh, Lord, we just want to thank you and praise you, Lord, uh, that we could be together tonight and study your word. Holy Spirit, we want you in our lives to a greater degree. Holy Spirit, we want to be led by you. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your voice. We want you to direct our steps. We want you to increase our faith. We want you, Father, to give us opportunities to be used by you. And Lord, I just pray that you would strengthen us, that you would help us to push down our fear, whether it be af afraid to have you in our lives or afraid you wouldn't show up or afraid that you would show up. Well, we just pray that you would help us, Lord, to be willing, Father, to even step out of our comfort zone in order to be used by you. And so, Lord, I pray for every person here tonight that you would, you would equip them, that, Lord, you would fill them again. Lord, we need to be filled again with the Holy Spirit. Lord, you said in your word that we are to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. And God, would you fill us again? Lord, would you fill me again? I need to be filled again by your Holy Spirit. God, there's one baptism, but many fillings. And so, Lord, we need to be, and Lord, would you fill this church again with the power of the Holy Spirit? And Lord, help us to be more sensitive to your presence, to hunger for your presence. And Lord, to want to live a life of adventure and live a life, Lord, where we know that you're, we're hearing from you and you're moving in our life. And so, Lord, we just, I just pray for a greater degree of surrender in our own personal lives. Would you help us, Holy Spirit, to bow down and surrender to you even more? And, Lord, we commit ourselves into your care today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.